Good morning, church. Uh, before we get into the text, uh, I have a sh- huge shout out uh, to Eric Watson. Shortly after the message last week, he sent me a text with the equation so that I could find the volume of air inside of a ping pong ball. And Actually, he filled in the equation for me and everything, which was super because that helped me out a lot. So, hey, Eric, thanks for that. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to my hairdresser. During these last uh, four to six weeks, Mr. Wall Razor, uh, he's, he's been in my basement the entire time, and I've just been really thankful for him. Uh, I don't know how the rest of you are doing with your hairdressers, but uh, just wanted to give a shout out to, uh, to my hairdresser today. In all seriousness, uh, let's get to the text, uh, Psalm 91. And as I shared last week, uh, some of these psalms that I've been reading and praying come from a time where I was outside here at the church uh, praying for you. And uh, Psalm 91 is one of those psalms. In a cursory reading of Psalm 91, we could be tempted to pray this as a prayer in such a way that we could believe that Psalm 91 would insulate us if we pray it the right way, if we have enough faith, if we have enough trust in God and we pray it the right way, that somehow Psalm 91 will insulate us from peril or despair or disease and will lead us to live some kind of a blessed and victorious life. And if that's what we believe about this text this morning, this psalm as we pray it, that it would somehow insulate us or it would be a psalm of insulation, then we would have to believe that uh, if we had enough faith or if we had enough trust, if we really, really, really believe, then really, really, really bad things aren't going to happen to us. But the opposite of that would have to be absolutely true. That if something really, really bad does happen to us, we must not have enough faith. I must not trust God enough. I've seen this devastating interpretation of Psalm 91 in real life. Several years ago, I had an opportunity, maybe a privilege, at least an opportunity to share some time with a very dear woman who um, was suffering, and it was terminal. And as I sat with her by her bedside, I had an opportunity to pray with her and share with her and just listen to her story. I also listened to her pastor talk to her about her lack of faith and trust because of the suffering that she was going through. It's like there's a neglect of the entire Bible when that happens. Joseph's story in Genesis would be ridiculous if that's what we believe. At least it would be ridiculous all the way up until Genesis 50 verse 20 where Joseph says to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Job's life would be ridiculous if that's what we believe because his friends even said to him, Job, maybe these things that are happening to you in your life because you don't trust God enough, because you don't have the faith that you need, that you've done something wrong in the eyes of God and he's punishing you for that. The story of Jesus would be ridiculous. I want you to hold on to that because you're gonna see it later on in the text when it comes to the life of Jesus. Psalm 91 is absolutely about God's protection over his people but not for the intention of giving us this carefree, risk-free, trouble-free, suffering-free reality of life. The purpose of the protection of God in our life is to hone us, to craft us, to mold us into imitating Jesus while trusting God in his very nature. That was a whole reason for Psalm 29 last week. So this morning in the text, I want to show you three things. I want, to, uh, I want to show you the invitation to God's protection. I want to show you the details of God's protection. And I want you to see um, the overcoming uh, outcome of his protection. 
So number one, the invitation to his protection. It's found in verses one and two and in verse nine as well. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, so there's the invitation to dwell or to abide in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, get this, in whom I trust. Here's the invitation to dwell or to abide in God. And there are four concrete names of God just in these two verses. Almighty, Most High, Lord, and my God. Again, Lord, in all caps, is the personal name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High God. Psalm 91 is considered to be like an... uh, the, the name of it is an, is an, or, an orphan psalm. The, they're not really sure scholars, some scholars believe that it's a psalm of David while other scholars believe it's actually a psalm of Moses. So because we don't know which one for sure really, they consider it an orphan psalm. But I want you to see this in the text. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That word shadow can uh, carry with it the definition or the idea of a shade. So imagine you're out on a really hot day. Oh, man, am I looking forward to really hot days. I'm not a big fan of winter. And so I'm looking for that really hot day. Imagine that day where the sun is shining down on us and it's so hot and you're sweating and you find a tree, this massive tree, maple oak, elm, and you get underneath that tree and there's this cool breeze in the shadow of the tree. That's the idea here. During this time of disruption of the normal life that we've been living here in the United States, you might have an opportunity, um, you might have some free time on your hands to do some reading. I would really like to encourage you uh, to read a book titled The Shadow of the Almighty. It was written by Elizabeth Elliot, and it's probably the best book written on the life of Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot is one of five missionaries. Jim Elliot, Nate Saint, Saint, uh, whose book Jungle Pilot is fantastic. So you have Jim Elliot, Nate Saint, Roger Udarian, Peter Fleming, and um, Ed McCulley, all five missionaries to the Wayadani tribe in Ecuador, and all five of those men gave their lives, were martyred, were murdered by the Wayadani tribe before they had the opportunity to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. In the midst of that massive tragedy, Elizabeth Elliot, understanding the protection of God, wrote the book, The Shadow of the Almighty. I would encourage you to read that book. Here's what he does in the text next. He says, I will, this is the response, so we dwell in the shelter of the Most High God. I will say to the Lord, this will be my response for abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say to the Lord that you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The the poet uh, doesn't deviate, but he kind of changes direction here with this imagery that God is my refuge and my fortress. It's a military stronghold. It's like Camelot. It's like this impenetrable uh, fortress, this, uh, this uh, utopia. And there's this invitation to dwell or to abide. That's the invitation to his protection. Let me give you the details because they're found, the details are found in verses 3 through 8 and then again in verses 11 through 13, because verses 9 and 10, we see the invitation to dwell again in God's protection. So let's look at the details of his protection, verses 3 through 8 and verses 11 through 13. The imagery here is that of a mother bird. For he will deliver, or maybe your translation says, surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions or with his Wings, uh, the flight feathers of a bird, and under his wings you will find refuge. The imagery here, the metaphor, it, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. But, but it's this image of a mother bird 
uh, protecting her young. Now, uh, we have to be careful here because this isn't um, attributing to God a femininity here. We know that because even in John 4, 24, Jesus says this to the woman at the well, God is spirit and they that worship him in spirit must worship in spirit and truth. The picture is, uh, it's a metaphor, it's, it's imagery here. And so you have this mother bird protecting her young. Uh, here at our church, over the last several years, every spring we've had this hen and drake ducks uh, that come onto our property and uh, she finds different places on our property and in our landscape to nest and to lay her eggs. And, uh, and I can tell you, uh, we can't get anywhere near her when she's nesting and laying her eggs because that drake is around all of the time. Then when she begins uh, just protecting and sitting on those eggs, you don't see the drake around much anymore. In fact, he's gone. I have no idea where he went. He's a, uh, he's a dad that's gone away to work. I have no idea. Uh, but the mom stays there and protects her young with her wings. That's the idea here. But then the poet shifts gears again. And in verse 4 he says, His faithfulness, just his faithfulness, and he goes back to military terms, is a shield and a buckler. What, what does that mean? His faithfulness is a shield. The idea, the imagery here is that God's faithfulness is like this, um, in military terms, that shield was about a six foot piece of steel or metal that uh, a warrior could buckle down, could, could hunker behind it and it would be a form of defense against the arrows or against the advancement of an enemy. Uh, we see that in Ephesians 6.16 6, uh, when Paul writes, above all circumstances, take on the shield of faith whereby you can extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith. Where does that imagery come from? Psalm 91, this, this faithfulness that's a shield. But, but he's not only a shield, his faithfulness isn't just a shield, it's also a buckler. <laughs> that's cool. The buckler is a, it's a round shield that's strapped to your arm. Hello? It probably has a star on it. It's red, white, and blue, and it's made of vibranium, right? This is like Captain America's shield. It's meant to be used for advancement against the evil one. That's what God's faithfulness does. And then the poet says this, because of all of that, you dwell in the shelter of the Most High. You abide in the shadow of the Almighty. His faithfulness is like a shield and buckler. He protects you with his wings. Because of that, verse five, you will not fear. But then he makes a list. You'll not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday, or a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense or the compensation of the wicked. You don't fear. The idea here is that you and I can trust God no matter what comes our way. God sizes up against the greatest fears and threats that this world has to offer. Whatever it is that brings terror by night or, or war by day or destruction, whatever that circumstance is, people around you may even die. And it will look like the wicked will win, but you'll see the recompense of the wicked. God sizes up against the greatest fears and threats that this world has to offer, and he totally dominates. That's what Psalm 91 is all about. This passage doesn't belittle our fears. This passage reminds us of the size of our help. You know, the most frequent command in Scripture is do not fear. It's a command that's found the most throughout the Bible. In fact, my 
favorite verse uh, that talks about not fearing or not being afraid is Psalm 41.10. You can look at it at some other time. Um, it's interesting that that's the most used command in Scripture, do not be afraid. And yet, the wisdom of Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not so much about having fear, it's where we place our fear, our reverence, our awe. We have a reminder again to the invitation in verse 9, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, it's the same as verse 1, the Most High who is my refuge, the same as verse 2, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. But here's where it gets really, really interesting. At least it did for me as I was uh, studying and reading through Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. We've seen that somewhere else in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, Jesus has just completed 40 days in the wilderness and is led into a time of temptation by Satan. And Satan actually uses Psalm 91. This should blow our minds that Satan knows the Bible and he knows how to use it. And what he does with Jesus is he tempts Jesus to sidestep suffering. Jesus, you don't have to go through suffering. You don't have to go through the cross. I promise you all of this if you'll just sidestep your suffering. What God the Father has called you, Jesus, to walk through. Satan uses Psalm, 30, or Psalm 91 to tempt Jesus to sidestep his suffering in this life. And Jesus battles back with Scripture, that, and, and he says, it is written. This should deeply concern us, that Satan, trying to sway Jesus from suffering and promising things that he that aren't, that aren't his to suffer, that Satan can promise this better life without suffering. And yet Hebrews 4.15 is so important for us because we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But in all things was tempted and yet was found to be without sin. Jesus gets suffering. He suffered the cruelest punishment that this world could dish out. And he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and despised the shame. He went to the cross for you and for me to show you that when we trust God, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. I think this blows the interpretation or the theory that if we just pray this prayer of insulation that nothing bad is going to happen. I think that passage, Psalm 91, and what Satan does with Psalm 91 obliterates that idea. And here's why I think that. I think that because of the outcome of his protection. So this is the third thing. Let's look at the outcome of his protection. Now, up until this point, the poet, the psalmist, has been writing this beautiful imagery with all these metaphors, and now God himself speaks. Verses 14 through 16, it's an oracle of God, and when God speaks, it is absolutely dynamic. He gives six I will statements. Because he, because you, because I hold fast to God in love, because he holds fast to me in love, here's some promises. I will deliver him. 
I will protect him. Can God be trusted? I will protect him because he knows my name. This is what it means to dwell and abide in God, is to know God himself, to be able to say to him, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, because I have this deep, intimate knowledge of who Jesus is and God who sent Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. I, God says, I will protect him because he knows my name. Verse 15, when he calls to me, I will answer him. How awesome is that? That when we are dwelling in the presence of God, we can call out to him and in his faithfulness, he answers us. He answers you. He answers me. But then he says this, and, and, and to me, for Psalm 91, this might be the best of the six I will statements. I will be with him in trouble. God doesn't say I'm going to circumvent trouble. God doesn't say I'm going to carry you over trouble. God doesn't say I'm going to eliminate trouble from your life. God says that he will be with you in trouble. And then he says I will rescue him and honor him. All of last week, Psalm 29 was about ascribing to the Lord the glory that is due to his name, honoring God. And isn't it interesting here that God will in turn, this is the beauty of Psalm 91, God will in turn not only rescue us, he will honor us. We don't have time to look at it this morning, but I encourage you, whether you do it with your family or sitting there individually, um, before you get up and walk away from our time together in God's word, go to 1 Peter chapter 5, and read verses 6 through 11. And, and view that idea uh, where God says, I will rescue him and honor him. View 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6, 6 through 11 in light of that promised oracle of God. The purpose of Psalm 91 isn't for us to get God to, uh, to give us what we want. The purpose of Psalm 91 isn't for God to give us what we want, but it's for us to figure out how we are to trust in him, to abide in him, to give us what he wants to give us, when he wants to give it to us, in the way that he wants to give it to us. I also want to encourage you with a little bit of homework. Uh, I, I know maybe some kids who are hearing this or teenagers, uh, I, I think Olivia is like, uh, finishing up her college career at home this week. Uh, and there are probably several others that are doing that this week. But I want to give you a little bit of homework. Every day this week, I want to encourage you to read Psalm 91. And then I would want you to also read its New Testament equivalent. Do you know what it is? It's Romans 8. Okay, so every day this week, take some time to read Psalm 91 and its New Testament equivalent, Romans 8. Now, I'm not having you read Romans 8 simply because it comes out of Pastor Nick's favorite book in the Bible, and it also happens to be his favorite chapter in the Bible. I have you reading it because it's the New Testament equivalent to Psalm 91. And so I just want to encourage you uh, this week in your quiet time to do that every day. In the midst of disrupt disruption, we have a protector, we have a rescuer, we have a deliverer, he is our refuge. I hope that you can say he is my refuge, my fortress in whom I will trust. We can find rest in the shadow of the Almighty, although there's been this great disruption or even if you're experiencing a new normal of life, much like Kent Blunier uh, shared uh, last week, that things are different, but they're still the same and yet they're different. Whatever your experience is inside of this disrupt disruption of a, a new way of life, here in the United States, uh, you can find rest in the shadow or in the shade of the Almighty. And my prayer for you is that verse 2 of Psalm 91 will be your prayer as you read Psalm 91 this week. That you could actually pray, 
I'll say to the Lord, Jehovah God. I'll say to the Lord, you're my refuge, my fortress, and I'll trust you completely. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, this uh, text uh, spoke to me over the last two weeks and I'm delighted that uh, you saw fit in your love letter to us, uh, your word to have Psalm 91 given to us. God, I do believe that you are, um, you're helping us, you're, you're aiding us in understanding or having a clear knowledge of what it means to truly trust you in the midst of a storm, in the midst of disruption, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of a risk, whatever that is that we can trust you when we abide in you, when we dwell in you, we can cling to your promises that you will be with us in times of trouble, that you will deliver us, that you will rescue us. And God, I don't know if it's in a place where you where you'll just pull us out of the mire where David says just pull me. I feel like hell surrounds me and God, you pull me out of that. I don't know if that's your plan for some that are listening today that you will pull them out of the fire. And I certainly don't know if it's your desire for them to walk through the fire. But may we rest in the promises of your oracle of Psalm 91, that you will rescue us, you will deliver us, you will be with us in trouble. And you will for sure, verse 16, God, you will with long life satisfy me. Satisfy the person that dwells and abides in the shadow of the Almighty. God, show us your salvation. Not just that initial salvation of a desired personal relationship with you, that you have saved me, that you continue to save me, and that you will always save me. You are my rescuer, my deliverer, my fortress, and my God. In Jesus' name, amen.